the wild world of Roman Jobs. Now, I'm going to preface this. This guy has a documentary voice, but that does not immediately mean that this video is boring. I've played the first 10 seconds. It might be a boring video. Ancient Rome was a multi-ethnic Just because he sounds like that doesn't mean it's boring. Ancient Rome was a multi-ethnic society with a large population that required a broad spectrum of jobs to sustain its economy. However, choosing their career was not always an option for the general people. This was only possible for people with higher status or inherited roles. Prestigious professions, military leadership, and political administration were reserved for the Roman upper class, whereas ordinary people were involved in various jobs. Moreover, the Roman Empire depended on slaves, and any wealthy person could keep as many as 500 slaves. The 500? people per person slaves were controlled such that they had to partake in challenging unpleasant works of low esteem the typical jobs were farming construction and domestic services and educated slaves could work in medicine teaching accounting and artists some jobs however like the orgy planner or urine collector were bizarre even <laughs> the orgy planner the or the 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 ancient rome orgy planner who the what do you even do? What do you pick the people that are going to be in the orgy? To the slaves. So today we will take a look at the weird- the piss collector? I know I've heard about a piss collector. Because they used to sell piss in ancient Rome. Before there was like dyes and stuff, they would sell pee. Right? Because it could dye clothing or you would brush your teeth with piss. Like piss was valuable in, in the ancient times. Roman job. The weirder a job is, the higher it is ranked we on the We still do that? Yeah, no, but people sell piss now for sexual gratification. Nobody sells piss now to dye clothing. ...while more normal jobs are ranked lower. Let's start off the F tier with a job that actually still exists today, even though it may have changed slightly. Just like our astrologists who try to predict your future by your zodiac sign or tarot cards, the ancient Romans had their own version of that profession. You're a Gemini, you probably experienced deja vu, the feeling that this moment has happened before, and you also experience- Bro, I saw a video on TikTok the other day of somebody duetting a video of food, and they were like, I'm a Taurus, so, you know, I- you, you better get that food away from me. I was like, oh, Jesus Christ. Like, fuck- just say you like food, right? It's not because you're a fucking Taurus. It's not because you were born in some specific fucking month that you like food. Everyone eats food! You just like whatever food that was there. Deja vu, the feeling that this moment has happened before. The Polarius were chicken interpreters who told the fortune of military campaigns based on how chickens ate. Instead of being tasked with taking care of more regal birds like eagles or owls, the Polarius had to take care of sacred military chickens. Sacred. Military. Chickens. One of the strongest empires in history literally had chickens that were relied on to tell whether a battle would go well or not for the Roman army. Before a battle, a Polarius would release the chickens and throw corn on the ground. If the chickens ate, all was well. If they ate so messily they dropped kernels, even better. If they didn't eat, oh no. If they refuse to come out of their cages, you may as well send everyone home. There even is a story about- There had to be times where that was proven wrong, though. They really fuck- Did it work, Oliver? Did it work? You really think whether or not eat- Whether or not the, the chickens eat the fucking corn kernels is gonna determine whether or not you win a fucking battle? No. But I'm saying, like, there's probably been, yeah, coincidences where, they're, where they ate and they won. But I'm saying, like- was there ever a time where, the, where the, the chickens were just fucking housing those kernels and then they got pummeled to the ground and they all died? They weren't like, what about the chickens? They said we were going to win. Like, what did they say then? One Roman fleet commander who was so impatient with the poor birds, understandably dizzy from sailing, not wanting to come out of their cage that he threw them overboard. He lost the battle and was scolded for drowning his fleet's sacred war chickens. I think this Bro, they really got mad at him because they lost the battle and blamed it on the fact that he threw the chickens in the water. ...perfectly defines the F tier. It is somewhat strange, but considering that we still do the same thing today, it's kind of normal at least for Yo, this- Yo, this is F tier. What's gonna be S tier job? Has to be orgy planner, right? We all know it, and we all hate it. You are at a party and someone approaches you, but damn you forgot their name which could result in embarrassment. Sucks for you, but the Romans were perfectly prepared for such a situation. 
The Roman profession of name caller or nomenclator had one simple task, to remember everyone's name at a party or other event. As Yo, that is a sick ass job. All you gotta do is know everyone's name. And then when somebody wants to say something, you're just like, that's Bob. That's Jonathan. I know you didn't remember that shit. What if you forgot though? Oh, fuck. What if you forget their name? Efficient as the Romans were, they had a backup for not remembering people's names at gatherings and parties, saving themselves from embarrassment. When people would approach their masters, the nomenclator would loudly announce the name of whoever would come, saving a deadly social embarrassment. Wow. What sounds like a funny party gimmick at first was actually also a crucial political instrument. Political candidates would be accompanied by their respective nomenclators, who prevented any embarrassment for the candidate. Whenever someone would approach the candidates in a friendly or personal manner, they would ensure the candidate by calling out the approaching person's name out loud. That's that so clutch, though. That's not even a weird job. That's, I mean, it's weird in the sense that nobody would have that today, but that's actually a sick-ass job to be able to just fucking say people's names and you actually help people in parties in situations where you don't remember somebody's name. I never remember somebody's name. Whenever you meet, whenever, I don't know if this is relatable. Whenever I meet somebody new and I shake their hand, I, I'm so fixated on saying my name is Joe, like what's up, I'm Joe, rather than remembering what the fuck they tell me their name is, right? It, whatever their name is, I don't even, I don't even process what they just told me their name is. I just look at them and I'm like, okay, I got to say my name's Joe, right? And then I, uh, the second I stop shaking their hand, I'm like, what the fuck did they just say their name was? That's why this job is in F tier, since it isn't weird, but rather unique. Vestal Virgins? This was the like last a religious thing. I heard of that. That for the F tier is the position of Vestal Virgins. In ancient Rome, the Vestals were known to be the priestesses of the Roman goddess Vesta, the goddess of the hearth, and were considered vital to the security of Rome. The duty of the Vestals was to keep the fire in the temple of Vesta burning. They believed that the failure to do so would lead to chaos in the empire. It was essential for the Romans that the Vestals were virgins. You might touch the finish line, but you've never touched a woman. You're right. I haven't lost my virginity. What the fuck this is was that obviously clip? a drawback and a risk at the same time. If they were to lose their virginity, they were usually walled alive and then left to dehydrate, a truly brutal punishment. Other Vestals who broke any other vow, such as letting the temple fire go out, were beaten behind a curtain in the dark. Holy However, shit. the good in all this was that they were treated fairly well and given special game seats. So all in all, I would consider this job to be quite normal. Oh, special game seats? If the fire goes out, I get whipped behind a curtain. But special game seats. You can't ever be in a relationship or else they're going to wall you alive and you're going to starve to death. But I get special Roman game seats. I got to watch the gladiator matches. Especially considering that even modern monks and nuns still vow to abstain from any sexual activity. Although luckily the punishments today aren't nearly as harsh. Funeral clowns. Now we enter the E tier with a rather interesting but kind of controversial right, job. In the ancient world, a funeral clown was common enough to leave behind records of clowns making fun of the dead at their own funerals. Holy shit. These funeral clowns would mimic the behavior of the deceased. It wasn't just any behavior either. They specifically picked ones that made the deceased look bad. Of course, I feel like that's fucked up. You have a fucking clown prancing around just like mimicking the worst traits of the dead person oh my god of course this was done in a funny way that wouldn't offend the audience which was likely made up of friends and family who wouldn't tolerate actual slander one amusing account from suetonius a roman historian tells of a funeral clown mocking vespasian the emperor famous for his role in building the Colosseum, for his stinginess the funeral clown was said to have asked the crowd while still pretending to be vespasian how much the funeral would cost him Considering that most of our modern death rituals are connected with immense grief, this might seem weird to many of you. However, I think the concept that a dead person gives his friend- Okay, now that they said it like that, I feel like that is- that does make it more lighthearted. Like, would that be bad? Like, him running around and being like, how much is this funeral gonna cost? Like, pretending to be him? I- I don't know. I don't think that is offensive. Friends and relatives one last laugh through one of these clowns doesn't sound too bad. 
In ancient Rome, asking the gods for help was common if one could not personally take revenge. A curse against their enemies was ordered by the hateful and the superstitious. The middlemen between the gods and the hateful person were called cursed tablet scribes. The entire day they would hear people's complaints of hate for others and oh. the wrongdoings they had endured. They would take people's requests for revenge and etch a curse onto a soft lead plate. Those cursed tablets were believed to have influential power against the gods, and they would either be nailed to the wall of temples or rolled up, placed underground in graves or thrown into wells or lakes. All manners of cruel punishments consisting of blindness, madness, and hopes of the enemy's intestines being eaten away would be wished for it. <laughs> and they would just etch that shit down? Yeah, Jimmy scammed me in a game of fucking poker. Put, put on the tablet that God strikes him down and lights his nuts on fire. Make sure to write down that the make sure to write down that one of them falls off too. I hope he goes blind. Put it no, also put it in the tablet that his wife leaves him. Yeah, no, make sure no, make sure his wife cheats on him with Brutus. Yeah, 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 yeah. You writing that down? In those curses. The treatment done to the material was compared to what should be done to the target of the spell. The curses would be written backward if needed to be extra effective. That's definitely a weird custom, but considering nowadays people use fake Twitter accounts to insult other people, this concept doesn't seem too far-fetched. Fuller. Now we are coming into the D tier featuring the Fuller. Fulling is the process of cleaning clothes, especially wool, to oh, remove- Oh, this is the piss thing. Oh, this is the piss thing. When you fucking stand in piss, because they dye the clothes. Oils, dirt, and other impurities, and make them thicker. Ancient Roman times were popular for fulling by making the slaves stand ankle deep in the urine. As filthy as it sounds, the practicality- Oh my god, you just stand in piss all day? Holy fucking shit, that's disgusting. Oh my god. It's like you're mushing grapes, making wine, but you're just standing in piss. And it's not even your piss. It's other people's piss. The of the concept lies in the fact that urine was a source of ammonium salts. It was known as the wash that assisted in cleansing and whitening clothes. The use of urine faded when more sophisticated concepts of water mills came into place. The job itself was basically a very early form of someone doing laundry, which isn't weird at all. However, the part where you have to stand in ankle-deep urine makes this whole thing relatively unpleasant, I would imagine. Oh my However, god, your feet probably fucking reek. After like seven hours of just standing in piss, you have like wrinkly toes and they're yellow stained. Ugh. Like, do you think it's hydrated piss or dehydrated piss? Somebody just said my dream job. Nah, get him out of here. Mods! <laughs> Mods, get him out! Mods, get him out of here! Oh, it you probably it would probably smell awful. You wouldn't be able to get that stench out, like no doubt. I would assume that it's probably like mildly dehydrated piss, probably dehydrated, because then there would be more ammonia in it. Like the yellower the piss, if you have like clear piss, that's like probably not that much chemical in it. The urine was actually so important in ancient Rome that they even had. What if a you have a cut, can you get an STD? Can you get an STD from pee? I don't know if you can get an STD from piss. I know it's bo it is bodily fluids. I thought it was like blood. Urine exposure likely won't put you at a risk for an STD, but it could. Oh, as long as it doesn't get into an orifice or wound. Okay, so it could get you. It could give you an STD. Another candidate for this tier is the position of armpit hair plucker. Armpit hair pluckers filled bathhouses with the screams of their clients. Roman baths were hubs of public life and of public image. One of the many services offered at the baths was armpit plucking employed by bathhouse guilds to manually pluck the armpit hairs of- Manually pull out your hairs on your fucking armpit? That would be so painful. Patrons with tweezers. The philosopher Seneca notes that the armpit pluckers would shout in the bathhouses to get people to get their pits plucked. And when the pit plucker wasn't shouting, he was forcing his customer to shriek instead of him. Honestly, this job was pretty normal considering that armpit waxing isn't out of the ordinary. Well, yeah, it's like the same thing as today. It's just they didn't have waxing. Now we enter the C tier. Also pretty weird. Vicarious were the middle managers between their masters and their fellow slaves. And yeah, we're literally talking about real middle manager slaves who managed other slaves. It just sounds like slavery with extra steps. Ooh la la, someone's gonna get laid in college. According to Vicky Leon, author of Working 9th to V, slave owners would buy slaves to serve as their body doubles at work and do their work for them. These vicarious would then be lived vicariously by their owners who would send them to do office. What? Wait, so they would get a slave 
to either manage other slaves or a slave to take their place in certain jobs. This work. It wasn't so bad of a gig either since it turns out that some vicars would be given access to part or all of their master's assets. Some of them would be paid a portion of the profits made, allowing them to eventually buy their freedoms. Oh, shit. Ironically, more enterprising slaves, however, would opt to buy their own vicarious and continue growing their master's wealth so they could continue taking a cut. So while this management position isn't far off from modern businesses, the ancient slaves aspect makes that job very questionable. Oh, there it is. Or orgy plant. Or no way orgy planters only at B tier. We finally enter the B tier with the job everyone has been looking forward to, the Roman orgy planner. The planners were responsible for- Yo, hold up, I gotta scan this part because I feel like he might show nudity. ...responsible for planning the perfect orgies and sex parties where guests freely partake in open and unrestrained sexual activities, including group sex. They had the authority to select That's the- what a fucking orgy is. ...food, drinks, and music, as well as women. Those women could attend the orgy who were capable of making the event of utmost entertainment for the guests. The Greco-Roman world shared the party god Bacchus, lord of wine and ritual madness, and celebrated him with the Bacchanalia. Attendants of these parties had a tendency to really tap into that divine crazy party energy and go around on a debauched, often violent sex spree. At one orgy, legendary bisexual Alcibiades, an Athenian statesman and his homies, stole the dicks of hundreds of statues throughout Athens. However, the planners were despised, especially by the lower class, as they thought the entire event to be unnecessarily luxurious and expensive, or simply because they didn't get an invite themselves. All in all, the job must have been really funny, but like, I- what do you do? You just plan, like, you pick the women that are gonna be in it, you pick the food, the drinks, and the music. Like, outside, it's, it's, so it's like planning just a regular event. But it's where people are gonna have an orgy. I think I don't even have to explain why this job description might seem weird to some people. We start off the A tier with the position of Stercorarius, or to say it more bluntly, the shit collector. That is one big pile of shit. Ancient Rome was famous for its aqueducts and toilets, innovations that were so advanced it would take centuries to see them return after the fall of Rome. What a lot of people forget is that a lot of these advanced services were available only for important public buildings. Think of the noisy bathhouse where the armpit plucker is trying to pluck your pits or government buildings. Well, they ain't even gonna choose their job. Like, it, like you could both, you could both just be ta like one of your friends. His task would be in an orgy planner, and now you're the fucking poop collector. Buildings, regular residential areas where most people lived, not on the plumbing grid. That's why the Stercorarius had to go from house to house and collect people's shit from their cesspools, bucket by bucket and wagon by wagon. He then had to drag all everybody's shit outside the city where he would sell it to farmers. For his troubles, the Stercorarius got 11 copper coins. Considering Rome's bumpy stone streets, it wasn't a rare occurrence for one of these shit wagons to literally flood the Stercorarius. So considering you were basically a personified toilet flush, this job was one of the weirder ones. I think that's the worst fucking job you could have. Having to walk around and collect poop in ancient Rome before there were machines and everything was hand done and you probably just had a shovel and you were just like just mounding shit into a fucking into a fucking wheelbarrow or some shit and then you sold it. You sold human poop. Laser for the sun. The urine tax collector was basically the big brother of the shit collector. As introduced by Emperor Nero, the urine tax was subsequently taken upon by his son Titus. Urine was widely used in various chemical processes, such as extracting ammonia to clean and whiten clothes, soaking animal skin before tanning, Bro, imagine and- having a, imagine having a sales tax on piss. Like, you wanna buy pee, and now you have to pay a sales tax. Because you're buying piss. Even using it as toothpaste, the urine would be si See, that is like, there, like, there's no way people thought that would, like, does that actually clean your teeth? Just brushing your fucking teeth with piss actually clean your fucking teeth. Summoned from public toilets and cesspools. When the finances of the Roman Empire had been crippled after nearly two years of civil war, Vespasian inherited the empire and left his successor with a profit through the urine tax collection from the urine gathered at public restrooms. When Titus Vespasian's son blamed his father for applying the tax on urine, he held a piece of gold coin procured from the tax against his nose and replied, Money does not stink.
The Whipping Boys? The position of the Whipping Boy was exactly as cruel as it sounds. The education of the royal children faced some difficulty in the 15th century as education was enforced through punishments. The divine right of kings that stated God and the king's son appointed the kings was to be punished by no one, but the king brought the tutors into a dilemma. Hence, as a solution, the appointment of whipping boys was established. Another boy studying with the king's son appointed by his son would be punished if he misbehaved or did not do his homework. Stay still! You are fucking kidding me! You're the friend? You're just some random guy that's studying with the king's son? And if he doesn't do his homework, you get fucking tortured? What? Because you're not allowed to fucking hurt the king's kid. And so that little brat is gonna just not do his homework and then you're just gonna get beaten for it. Is it so they don't fucking... I, I would assume it's because... It's it's like trying to, to solve the issue, right? Because it, it, it's... It's an impenetrable, po impenetrable problem in that, like, you can't get the kid to do anything, right? Because he's immune. So instead, you would get him to befriend another person, and then if he starts slacking, that kid gets hurt, and then now the kid, the king's son feels guilty, and he'll start doing his work. Like, imagine you're immune from punishment, but your friend isn't, and so your friend just gets beaten whenever you fuck up. And so you'll feel bad and then not fuck up. In return, the whipping boy was granted noble titles and estates for his service once he was an adult. Oh. The idea behind this was the hope of developing a bond between the two, leading yeah. to the royal infant behaving and studying well to end the whipping boy's misery. Oh my god, but what if they didn't give a fuck? What if the king's son was just like, I don't care, and then he just gets beaten every day? So while this job could provide you with titles and other rewards, it must be a horrible feeling to get a bloody punishment for the mistakes a stuck-up child of the royal family made. Okay, so the whipping boy is the worst job. From orgy planners to the cursed tablet scribe, it is safe to say- Does this sound- I feel like the audio just sounds weird now. Say ...that the ancient Roman Empire had a room full of extremely strange professions. And while many of these professions seem very funny, there are also some very dark ones especially considering the harsh Any punishments the whipping boys and vestal virgins had to face. In the end, the Roman Empire never ceases to amaze us with its extravagant lifestyle. But that is it for today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. W fucking game. Or not W game, W video. That was actually a good-ass video. Fucking learning about all those weird-ass jobs. All right. <laughs>